So urban development in terms of carbon mitigation, we have got Mission Bhagiratha to supply water to 67 year in Telangana and uh, similarly rural development, rural uh, in terms of rural development, around uh, 25,000 rural adaptations will be covered in Mission Bhagiratha. So these all come to an adaptation, climate adaptation, the state is being doing. Because all these things, high things will come, I showed you in the beginning, we have around 10 sectors to be addressed by the governments in terms of adaptation and mitigation. So these are the INDCs in India, I told you already, 30 to 35 percent uh, level we have reduced by the year 2030, and 40 percent of uh, the power should be in terms of uh, uh, solar, and um, 2.5 5 to 3 billion tons carbon dioxide equivalent trees that we need to go to the power station. I think I'm within the time. Yes, we have questions. I think we are well within the time. Thank you very much. Thanks for sharing your experience, particularly in Mavro, which is from agricultural adaptation, but it's a very, very good experience, and so a lot more results have to come. Any more questions to Dr. Shinwan? Survival is the problem. Survival is the problem. Yes, and so much of
climate change regulation. So basically, uh, as we are discussing about climate change, so my topic is basically related to how climate change is affecting urban area and what are the different processes happening in urban area so that it intensifies the process of climate change. Okay. So here, uh, so in climate change, basically, uh, as you know, when you talk about urbanization, so now we see that about 3.5 billion or 50 percent of the total population in the earth becomes urban population as for 2010 and it would, uh, it would be uh, projected that in, uh, in 2050 it becomes 84 percent. So it means every year the population becoming urban uh, and as you know there is more rural and urban migration and urban area in different parts that is a small city but every year it becomes congested. And uh, that is, uh, and second one, uh, related to that, uh, there are several uh, factors or several processes due to uh, the process of urbanization which, uh, which affects the urban area. Basically, that first one is uh, the natural land use pattern or land use, uh, changing land use pattern in urban area, then removal of tree, then another one is construction of buildings and roads, then uh, uh, this processes, basically all these processes modify the surface albedo, basically a climatic process and another one is, uh, uh, another one is large population in urban area leads to greater consumption of food and greater consumption of energy and uh, another one is that all the processes related to these are uh, increasing every year. So in urban area, because of all these processes, there is a various stress on urban environment. Okay. Then, uh, okay. So basically, uh, as I am discussing about urbanization and climate change, there are so many uh, definitions given by UN Habitat and the uh, like Clinton Foundation. So they have mentioned that that they all these all they have left urban area responsible for climate change. And as for that, they mentioned that 75 percent of global energy is uh, energy consumption and 80 percent of greenhouse gases emissions are uh, happening in urban area. Okay. Then uh, and second one is uh, similar thing is repeated by Clinton Foundation also. And uh, there are several other factors which are responsible for climate change and more than per capita carbon dioxide emissions in urban area. That include uh, one is city's geographical location that will, which includes the energy consumption uh, and for heating and cooling and then the uh, second one is geography. Demography either it is sparsely populated or densely populated. That also affects the energy consumption and carbon dioxide emission in urban area. Third one is urban carbon density that is urban crawl etc. Then urban economy. The type of economic activity uh, occurring in that particular area either that is industrial or not. This, that also contribute to climate change or more carbon dioxide emission in that particular urban area. Then another point uh, related to this is urban area, urbanization and land use land cover change. Okay. So urbanization and land use land cover change. So basically when urbanization occurs, so we, in the, we, we, we want to uh, settle more people in a small area. So that basically leads to land use land cover change. Instead of uh, every year, there, uh, there is increase in cement, concrete pavement, uh, construction of more and more buildings, and reduction of agricultural land, and reduction of green spaces. And all these processes lead to a uh, process which is known as the urban heat island. And urban heat island is basically a new concept. And it is uh, basically uh, mostly in case in urban heat island. Uh, since the last 40 years, there are so many research related to urban heat island and this phenomenon was first, uh, uh, first uh, discovered in England in 150 years back. So urban heat island is that, this is referred to a phenomenon of higher atmospheric temperature in urban area in comparison to the rural counterpart. So we feel that as climate change is a phenomenon that observed everywhere, but when we compare, uh, compare it in uh, case of urban area and a rural area, so we mark temperature difference in that two particular area due to the effect of urban heat island. Because urban area have more heat in comparison to a rural area. 
and this uh, uh, diagram basically we explain the temperature in urban area and rural area. So the central part basically we can say the CPD, uh, the central village district of urban area having more compact and more congested building. So in that area uh, more temperature, we observe more temperature in comparison to the uh, the peripheral area where we found some certain of wind cover and sparse settlement. So this explains uh, the process, uh, this, uh, this figure explains the uh, urban heat island structure in terms of temperature difference. The second one is uh, first uh, as my topic C is urbanization and uh, the problem associated with climate, uh, urbanization and climate change and, and uh, like mitigation or regulation measures for that. So urban planning, so basically nowadays we have so many uh, projects related to urban planning. So here yeah, we, we need to include uh, like urban planning in terms of like reducing all this impact of climate change. Like planning while uh, making plan, if uh, preparing plan for any urban area, we should give proper measures to this climate change phenomena also so that we can reduce temperature and other in associated impacts urban research, climate change adaptation and mitigation. So here, in urban research, uh, refers to the land use uh, covered with natural man-made man vegetation uh, in the built-up area and planning area. So uh, there are so many definitions related to urban research. Like basically, in uh, different literature, we refer tree cover or forest cover, but that does not include all the green cover. Like in urban area, there are park, green space, like. Uh, Patches of glasses, so all these are included in urban green space. So this term urban green space that include all the greeneries in an urban area, either that is public or private. So as you know, uh, benefit of urban green space. So there are so many environmental benefits of urban green space that is of that work for climate change and so many uh, environmental benefits. So first one is biodiversity conservation. The re removal of atmospheric pollution. In urban area, we found more pollution. Uh, day by day, the pollution is increasing. Either in, term, in terms of we can say carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide. So, uh, the green space have the capacity to absorb that pollution. There are so many research on, the, on that. Not in India, but we found many research in like, abroad. In developed country, mostly people focus on this uh, dimension. Then, oxygen generation. Then noise reduction, stabilization of soil, groundwater, uh, groundwater recharge and prevention of soil erosion. So here we are uh, in, in case of climate change, when we are talking about like water harvesting or supplying water to different urban area, so we can do that in, uh, when we plant more and more tree or when we uh, preserve urban green, then basically it automatically recharge the groundwater. And in one way that can solve the problem also. Then, the message what would like to give that? Then we'll Yes, sir. What is the message you would like to give to us? Okay, sir. Actually, uh, government have also taken so many initiatives, and in my previous presenter, they have also mentioned about like Green India mission. And in that also, the mission is that uh, focuses on increasing green cover. That also includes urban area, but most of our urban planning that doesn't address that uh, particular aspect of uh, Green India mission. And we are facing more problems in urban areas in comparison to rural area. And here, uh, due to the urban heat problem, there are so many diseases like related to heat stroke, etc. We feel in urban, we found in urban area, and mostly the poor people in urban area, they uh, are mostly affected due to that problem in comparison to rich people. And here, in case of uh, this, uh, the important uh, aspect is that in different uh, cities in India, we found that the green cover is reducing day by day. Daily, uh, daily as far as the study of FSI, uh, Indian Forest uh, Service Research, so that uh, as for that, daily only 20% green cover, then 49% in Chandigarh, and in Hyderabad, it is only 5%. So as you know, it becomes a complete jungle. And you, uh, you, uh, there are so many studies which reflect that in Hyderabad, the temperature is in increasing uh, in a very faster rate in comparison to other area. And Bangalore is a city which is considered as green cities of India. But that is also the green cover in Bangalore is also reducing day by day, and it's only 6.85 percent now, as for 2000.
public level study. And in case of Gujarat, there is a study undertaken by Gujarat Forest Department, and we found that in Gujarat there is so many cities having more than 50 percent uh, of wind power in that area. So, uh, uh, as, uh, as in case of climate change, they are addressing uh, that uh, the city specific uh, problem by uh, by renewing or regenerating green space in their cities. So, uh, as per this study, uh, my Focus is that we have studied, we have uh, started a study, we are conducting a study on Bhumiyatar and we are focusing on urban heat high and land and uh, linking that into urban green cover. So we found that in different areas where there is green cover, we found less temperature, but when there is more building, there we found more temperature. And basically, I have not seen the uh, not added that here. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. Okay, sir. Uh, but uh, with the help of satellite imagery, like meteorological department, they provide uh, uh, data related to uh, like climate change, uh, climate temperature, rainfall, etc. But they cannot give specific data related to a particular city because within the city there is variation in temperature. So with the help of satellite images and GIS remote sensing studies, we are uh, uh, conducting study on Bhumiyata and we uh, come to a conclusion that how green cover uh, reduce temperature in different areas. Yes, sir. What is the solution to Hyderabad? Yes, sir. What is the solution to Hyderabad? Sir, in solution to Hyderabad, that suppose it is a green in a green cover is a cost effective effective measure, and green cover is that that work in two way in terms of mitigation and in terms of adaptation. As we have addressed about mitigation and adaptation. Uh, mitigation is that we can reduce the increase in carbon dioxide and adaptation is that that provides the cooling effect. <coughs> so there is work on both ways. And as Sir also mentioned about like water etc. So that also helps in recharging the ground water in different parts of the city also. So in that case it helps it work and there are so many studies focusing on this aspect but in India we found very few studies related to this uh, topic. Government is planting wherever place is available. You can tell us if there is a summer place to be planted, we will enter the government. Any quantification? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are working uh, and it is in a preliminary state, so I have mentioned about uh, all the topics you are seeing. So I have to work on that information. I have already got a warning from the organizers. Thank you very much, Madam. We will move to the next presentation, please. Uh, Arakita Behra from the University of Hyderabad, is she here? Next is uh, Dr. Prabhat Kumar Pankaj from Greta Hyderabad. Climate change and livestock adaptation and mitigation strategies, very important from my first opinion. You have done a lot of work, Greta and the Greta scientists in this area, and there are examples uh, for all over India, but please listen to tell me. We all have to adhere to that. And the delegates. Uh, actually, on this topic, uh, why I have chosen this topic? Because livestock sector under agriculture is very important. They are uh, contributing majorly to the GHG emissions, as well as they are being affected by the uh, climate change issues. So, both ways they are being affected. They are causing the climate change and they are being affected by the climate change. If you see, see the basic data, uh, all around the globe, there are <coughs> almost 600 million poor smallholder farmers. And this livestock sector, which is contributing 17% of food calories. Dr. Parke, we move your experience and data. We all have been telling her in the morning and I told her, we move your experiences, you have done an excellent job in. Uh, so, so, actually, we have to basically we have to see uh, a balance between the livelihoods food security and environment because not only climate change is important we have to see the perspective of uh, the livelihood and food security also if you see uh, what is the uh, uh, the different parts of the management system of livestock which is contributing to the greenhouse gas emission you can see the food production the manure management and uh, uh, the processing of feed and the industry they are majorly contributing to the climate change in the livestock sector. Simultaneously, uh, when there is uh, 
change in temperature, change in concentration of CO2 or change in the, the precipitation rate, basically the C3 plants are affected more as compared to C4 plants. Due to that, there is change in the forest constitution and that is majorly affecting the uh, uh, affecting the climate change effects to the livestock because livestock 60% of the fee cost uh, is there in the cost of production and once that forest is being affected it is majorly affecting the livestock production system. If you see the total GAG emission from different subsector uh, in the agriculture livestock is contributing 63% so it is one of the major player However, second is the rice cultivation and other parts. So, uh, and if you see the species wise, cattle and buffaloes are the major contributor. However, in the rain fed areas or dry land areas, majorly goat and sheep are being reared. And it is also one of the natural adaptive process we are doing in the rain fed areas because they are emitting less, their capacity is less, so they are emitting less methane. If you see the different uh, part where they are contributing the GHG or greenhouse gas, major is the enteric fermentation, that is the animals are emitting uh, methane uh, by the fermentation inside their system. So that is the major contribution, one thing. Second is the how the manure are being utilized, the livestock manure, because in crop livestock mixed system, uh, this type of problem is less because the manure are being exposed to, to the oxidation system. However, when uh, in the field condition, when heaps are there and they are untreated like that, so there is undue fermentation happening in the soil. That's why uh, almost 60.4% is being contributed from the uh, use of manure. And when you go for the cattle and buffalo, measure is from the enteric fermentation. However, in case of pig and chicken, the measure is from the feed. So basically, adaptation strategies in case of livestock, we will be doing uh, to avoid the climate risk, one thing. And second thing, we have to improve the resilience of the animals. So basic things I won't cover. Just first one is the breeding strategy. Because we have, uh, the productivity of animals uh, from India is very less. But simultaneously we have the local breeds which are very much adapted and second thing they are very much resilient because of their, uh, uh, the, the ability of the animals to the heat tolerance as well as disease tolerance. So uh, we have to protect our germ plasm. So in the beginning we have to go for the, the basic breeding strategy that we have to promote our local animals. Uh, simultaneously uh, we need not to compromise with the production. Because as the productivity of the animal enhances, so the mitigation, it is one of the mitigation measures. The GHG emission per kg of animal will be reduced. So our strategy should be to enhance the productivity also. So we should not compromise with that. That is possible one thing that some of the managemental aspects like during summer, we need to go for the feeding of animals during the morning hours. Uh, during winter, we have to uh, change the timing of the feeding operation in the evening hours like that. There are certain things we, uh, if we take care, we can, uh, we can well adopt our livestock of Indian conditions. Simultaneously, uh, 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 in, in the village condition, if you see, there is crop livestock integration. So that is one of the adaptive process because by that way, we are diversifying our assets uh, into crop, horticulture and different livestock sectors. So uh, we should promote the mixed livestock farming system if we, we are talking about the adaptive measures. Simultaneously, there should be some managemental practices like provision of shed and water to reduce heat stress from increased temperature and herd composition, especially in the rainfed area, uh, we should shift towards the small remnants uh, as compared to going towards the bovine and all those things. So that should be our strategy. Not only this thing, we have to look towards the science and technology development. We have to think about the breeds because uh, there is breed differences also in terms of methane emissions and adaptation. So both things we have to see, we have to screen the genetic types and based on that we have to decide that which area is fit for which type of species and which type of breed of animal. Apart from that, health issues and soil and water management issues these needs to be addressed as a part of science and technology development. Capacity building of farmer, we have conducted several studies at CREDA and we have found that uh, adoption of the climate uh, mitigating 
uh, strategy to the farmers it is very low. So we need to educate the farmers, one thing. Second thing, we need to train the trainers. So this uh, may be the better adaptation strategies and uh, institutional and policy changes, especially CREDA is working towards the contingency planning. Because in, in the contingency planning, we are suggesting that at the time of flood, at the time of drought, or any type of climatic extreme, what we should do uh, to the animals so that they, they are well adapted and less damage is being caused to the farmers. As far as mitigation is concerned, uh, our basic aim in livestock is the, uh, in, is the re reduction of GHG emission from the animal. So that is possible basically by three ways. First is the different animal feeding management system, second is manual management, and third is the management of feed crop production. So if we go into the detail, we have to promote the uh, faster growing breeds if we really want to mitigate uh, the emission caused due to the livestock. Second thing, uh, we have to strategize all the animal husbandry practices like nutrition, health, dietary supplements. Nowadays there are certain dietary supplements with very meager amount of investment, uh, they are methane, uh, uh, they are methane mitigators, which you can give it to animals so that they will emit less methane from their gut. So those things we can do, and better waste management because waste again they are causing more than 70 percent of the emissions from livestock. So like uh, we have to manage the uh, uh, the excretas coming out of the animals by uh, by putting it into the value addition chain like. Uh, the biofertilizers and different things. So in conclusion, I, I would like to say that climate change adaptation, mitigation practices and policy frameworks, they are very critical to protect the livestock production. Diversification of livestock animals using different crop varieties and shifting to crop livestock systems seem to be the most promising adaptive measures. As well as the uh, emission in concern or mitigation side, the improvement of animal nutrition genetics are most important because of endemic fermentation is a major GHG <coughs> emitter in the livestock sector. And uh, however, the efficiency of these practices in reducing emission is uncertain, so much more of the research studies are need to be conducted in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank very much. How many people in this area, sir? Sunita Srikant. Yes, sir. After this, you take part. Environment of trans and rice lines for enhanced tolerance to different abiotic and biotic stress. Everyone, please do. Sir, Pankaj, yeah. You are talking about mitigation and but do you have an underground maybe carbon footprint study? Yes, yes. Have you quantified? Yes. Invented your build up? Actually, we are the leader in Nikra, that's the initiative of climate resilient agriculture. So we have different partners. I think more than 50 institutes are involved in doing it. And last five years we are doing all those things. So you have GG protocol, last time you have taken? Yeah, yeah, it is there. Scope 1, scope 2, scope 3. We have actually IPCC 1 and means tire 1, tire 2, like that, scope like that thing. So tire 2, uh, we are doing actually final outcome is yet awaited. But I too, we are doing it. Okay. Yeah. Final question that you have your GHG inventory in place, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, I will give a clear off to those involved with the Ranjay Rice Lines for Enhanced American Bags. Good afternoon to everyone, respected chairman, distinguished partners, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I would like to thank the organizers, especially Dr. Janaki, for giving me this opportunity to share with you what work which we have been carrying out at our Center for Plant Microbiology, Usman University. Now, since morning, you have been listening to the impact of climate changes on food production. No doubt, we have to feed about 10 million people within two years, not correspondingly increasing the air demand. <coughs> so, how to make our plants or the crops to be more effective under this climate change conditions. So one of the approaches which is more appropriate, more efficient is the genetic modification of crop plants or the innate ability to withstand various environmental conditions. So in that context, the whatever the crops, major crops, those crops have to be made 
to be amenable to the manipulation for withstanding the both biotic and abiotic stresses. These two kinds of stresses cause at least about 50% of the crop yields worldwide. So if you can, one, one approach to increase the current agricultural productivity is to develop the high yielding varieties, that one aspect. The second aspect is to reduce the yield losses caused by these biotic stresses or abiotic stresses. By approaching these two, or by combining these two approaches, one can withstand the, the coming climatic changes as well as to keep the, the balance of the thing. So in that context, we have been modifying the rice to withstand various biotic and abiotic stresses. Today, I am going to present you the part of our work regarding the rice plant, how to make rice plant to resist to all the types of abiotic stresses. As you all are aware that all these are the different abiotic stresses which cause significant loss to our crop productivity. Plants have innate ability to withstand these stresses. Also, they have the variable degree of genetic plasticity to adjust these environmental conditions. So, as a plant bio biotechnologist, I would like to isolate genes or isolate the specific candidate genes which can prove effective to tolerate these abiotic stresses. So, plant cell has the ability to stress. The, to recognize the stress signal and also modify its metabolic pathway so that there will be certain compounds which will be synthesized and those compounds only will be able to protect the plant. So if one can identify those genes or products so that they can engineer into the crop plants and finally make the plants tolerant to this abiotic stress. And these, the, all so far the genes which have been isolated are classified into two kinds. One is structural genes, other one is regulatory genes or regulatory proteins. So especially these regulatory proteins are highly useful for making plants tolerant to these different abiotic stresses. So as I told you, now we have to identify new source of genes as well as promoters to introduce them into plants and making plants tolerant to these different stresses. So one of the plants which we have identified is the pigeon bee, which can grow in various agroclimatic zones, which can tolerate various types of abiotic cells. So in the initial project, we have isolated genes from this pigeon bee by subjecting them to different stress conditions. This project was supported by the AP Netherlands biotechnology project. So this is the, of course, technical, I am not going into the technical details of this in view of the time. So this is the library we call it subtraction library for isolating the differentially expressed genes in the plant. So with that now we have identified thousands of genes from the pigeon pea and out of that these genes are classified conferring to various metabolic processes. So among that we have identified about half a dozen genes which are very crucial for conferring plants resistant to or tolerant to different stresses. So today I am going to present the first two genes that is Kajanas Kajan, hybrid protein rich protein and coding gene and Kajanas Kajan, cold and dove regulatory protein. These two proteins are very essential for tolerating the various abiotic stresses in the rice plant. So we have cloned the genes under the control of a constitutive promoter that means which express continuously the growth and development of the plant. Another promoter is a stress inducible promoter. This promoter will express as and when the plant has six pieces. So that way, the, when you use stress inducible promoter, you can minimize the metabolic waste of the energy for diverting itself unnecessarily synthesizing the protein. So keeping that, we clone the genes in two different promoters and we confirm the molecular way by Southern Blood analysis. And then we validated this carbon price plants at different stages. So this is the what seedling state. When we subject them to seedling state, you can see the compared to control plants, the carbonic lines are performing better. And similarly, at vegetative state, around 70 to 80 days old, again we subjected them to various stresses, and you can see the all the carbonic lines are performing better than the control plants. Now, we want to know how this particular protein is able to provide the protection to the rice plant under these various conditions. So we first localize where this protein integrates in the plant cell. 
So now you can see the bottom one, the protein is present in the cell wall sucking plant. So that means it is the protein is interacting with the, the cell translation mechanism, thereby it is activating the other related associated genes so that the plants are able to protect when we overexpose this particular protein in the rice plant. Of course, we also measured various physiological parameters. In all the physiological parameters, you can see significant difference between the control and primary part, indicating that this particular protein is able to give protection to the rice plants under these environmental conditions. Not only that, when we allow them to grow and mature and set the seed, you can see the non-genic plants able to set seeds under this extreme environmental conditions which we impose during the vegetable stage of the rice plants. Now, also we estimated the different enzymes because how this particular protein is interacting with our genes and making them more in the rice plant so that the reactive oxygen species which is generated during stress conditions will be uh, detoxified by these enzymes. That's why the plants are able to tolerate this extreme environmental condition. Not only that, this particular rice plant, when we overexpose this protein, we observe that this plant is able to give resistance to a blast disease caused by magnopotal vaccine. That means a particular gene is able to function in different ways and give the protection to the plants not only by abiotic stress but also the biotic stress. So that's what we need the, under the changing environmental conditions, the climatic conditions, the plant, if you express few genes so that the plant should survive and set the seed so that we can get the sustainable tree levels under extreme conditions. When we analyze the, how this particular protein is interacting with different genes and then we take the microarray, you can see thousands of genes are up and down the grade. So these are the genes which are responsible for causing this particular significant difference in the family part. We also validate a specific candidate genes and one of the beta B conception factor which is elevated very high level in the non plants when we over this, we over this protein. That means this protein is interacting with this conception factor. So this conception factor is in turn regulating the other sustainable proteins, thereby causing the rice plant to resist to all these stresses. This other gene which I mentioned, the cold and drought regulatory gene, this particular gene also comes for three types of different avoidance stresses. In the previous thing, I forgot to tell you this. The Kajanus Kajan hyperbolic is protein and protein gene comes for high resistance, high tolerance to heat, that is very, very important. Heat and droughts, they go together. Whereas this particular cold or drought regulatory gene, it gives more protection to the cold conditions than the high temperature. So when you combine these two genes, I hope the rice plant can survive the both extreme temperatures as well as drought and cell conditions. So same similar. In this case, this protein, in the previous protein, it only accumulates or prevents the cell wall level. But this protein could enter into the nucleus and interact with various other genes so that the plant, rice plant can become more tolerant to the cell wall. So this is the same because in view of the yeah. time, yeah, I will go through the same results. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. these are the same thing. So that means in conclusion, I would say that if you inhale rice plant with this these MP genes, I am sure you can make rice tolerant to various metabolic and biotic Thank you very much. I think, uh, well, thanking the organizers, I request uh, my co chair and interest that few of us to conclude to the world. Any questions? Uh, welcome back to Professor Rao. Otherwise, uh, I request that few of us to conclude. Any questions? Rao, I think it is good that uh, they are doing. How, what is the uh, but actually when we express this protein in the yeast, the yeast cannot survive beyond 30 degrees. When we express this protein, the yeast can, could survive up to 45 degrees. One more question from my side. The, the second one uh, you are talking about the cold and uh, drought. I think it's very interesting, a lot of people don't know that. The drought can take place in cold climate also. Europe, the most cold countries also, can face drought situations. Cold itself because of the lack of uh, photosynthesis of the function, that's a drought condition. Maybe your research would be helpful to the uh, northern cold countries. Not only that, in Kalangana. In Kalangana, yeah. sometimes. Sometimes, sometimes yeah. 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 And sir, is this going to be um, produced at a larger scale so that uh, 
we distributed uh, to the farmers and uh, and yeah, yes, the yeah. implications of yeah. is it going to be yeah. 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 but there are regular issues here. So unless we complete the bio safety issues, we cannot distribute this thing. I think we have presentations and this session like uh, uh, climate change opportunities. Like uh, we have started with uh, Dr. Nassar on how climate is not agriculture, adaptation to climate change, we have presentation, followed by Sustainability in uh, uh, Business Strategy Cooperation by Dr. Goha and uh, of course myself from uh, on climate change policies being implemented in Telangana uh, and then by ma'am on uh, the green space available in the cities and a good presentation by Prabhakar, okay. Dr. Prabhak, Dr. Prabhak Kambakar Shah on the live talk. And uh, do a very good presentation by Dr. Rao on uh, rights, lines, enhanced tolerance to different identified parties. And we we'll thank the organizers for giving the opportunity to, to go chair this session. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you. And the chair, uh, David Prasadu Garu, and the, the discuss and session seamless and uh, Supriya Gohaji for his invited lecture. And I thank all the speakers for their uh, nice presentations.